is the very first lecture in this class, Properties of Linear Time Invariant Systems. You see here a combination of important words, linear time invariant systems. You're going to study dynamic electrical systems that are linear. We're going to see what, we'll see what that means later and time invariant. That's, we'll, that will limit the scope of what you're going to see to a subclass of systems. Physical systems are typically not linear, nor are they time invariant. But here we have to make that assumption to make an approximation of certain systems, of their behavior, and convert them in linear time invariant systems, because in that way we have the mathematical tools needed to describe them. Of course, we can describe nonlinear systems and time variant systems using differential equations very well, but the analysis is a bit different. It takes a lot more calculus. Here we're going to limit that to linear time invariant, and that will be the basis of everything you're going to see in the class. All the operations that we're going to use, the mathematical foundations in this class, we'll assume the systems to be linear and time invariant. So in this, this lecture is relatively basic. We're going to see what that means. And of course, we're going to see what a system is. And just to re-emphasize on the objectives of this class. So this is a simple introductory lecture. Um, what we're going to cover here is more the topics uh, or the, uh, the concepts of a system and uh, again, re-emphasize what do we want to achieve in this class. So we're talking about systems. So what is a system? A system is a combination or an integrated of integrated components that act together to achieve a certain goal. So some, some examples that I have here with this one are only a few an electric motor, a combustion motor engine, um, a hydraulic system, a car, electric circuits, batteries, operational amplifiers, a robot arm, a assembly line, a camera, uh, a, a dishwasher, autonomous systems, a rocket, a water tank, whatever. Any sort of combination of different elements that is there to perform a given task that is designed to perform a certain task. And in that system, from now on, will be represented as a box like this one. This box represents all these elements that will perform a given function. The system will now take an input and we have a output. So the inputs are provided to the system. We are going to represent them as arrows going into that system and the outputs are the arrows coming out of that system. For example, if we had the system as a electrical motor, let's say a AC or DC motor, a potential input to this would be a voltage applied to that motor. A potential output of interest could be the speed at which the motor rotates, or it could be the position of the rotor, or it could be the current developed in the armature of that motor. It really depends on how, what we want to analyze on that system. A robotic arm, for example, could also be the system. If the robotic arm is here, what potential inputs can we give arm to the robot? Well, we could control the individual position of each joint in the robot and watch the position of the end effector, position of the tip of the robot. We could give an input uh, as a torque applied to each of these joints and watch the output speed. We could give a voltage to each joint, each rotor of each motor in, in each joint and see where the, how the robot moves. So it really depends on what do we want to analyze, what do we want to study based on the, uh, f f about that system. In this box, when you have a system, this box will now represent the system and the way we represent in, uh, uh, something as engineers is through a model. And this model will be a set of differential equations that will describe the behavior of that system that will now link these two arrows here, this flow of inputs and outputs. So we pass the inputs through the equations, through the system, 
through the equations that describe the system. And we now watch the respective outputs of that, that uh, operation. So there are three distinct and important parts here. The first one are the inputs themselves. How do we characterize this input? There are many different types of inputs that could be given to a system. The system itself is the second element. We need to model the system accordingly to accept those inputs. And the third element is the output. Given the system equations, given the input, how do we calculate the output in the system? Now we need tools to solve for these differential equations and then find the respective output given the input. Okay. Here is another example. We have here a water tank and we want to analyze the uh, temperature of the water in the tank. So that's the, what we want to study for whatever reason. We want to model the variation of temperature in the tank given certain operating conditions. To do that, we'll need some inputs and we need some, um, we need the model for the water itself. So possible inputs that we need to consider here, once we establish the differential equations that describe the volume temperature uh, of the water in the tank, we need to consider also all inputs going. For this particular case, possible inputs could be the flow rate going in the tank, could be the temperature of whatever is coming into the tank. It could also be the, the concentration, the density of the material that is entering the tank. The output here could be the temperature. That was the primary goal was to use all these inputs to look at the model and then calculate the temperature of the water in the tank. But we could also extend the analysis to include other possible outputs, other possible variables of interest. For example, the level of the water in the tank could be one. The flow rate of the water coming out could be another one, or uh, the total volume of the mass of the, the fluid in the tank. Which one we choose? Well, it all depends on what we want to study. Okay. Here is another example. Here we have an electrical circuit. That's the model, and. If you want to analyze the system, we could we have to specify an input. The input could be a current applied to this source here, or it could instead be a voltage, a DC or AC voltage applied to it. And the output could be anything we want. It could be the current through this branch. It could be the voltage from this point here to the ground. It could be the voltage differential between this point and that point. It could be the current here, it could be the current there and so on. It could be the charge in this capacitor, but it all depends on what we want to study. Or it could be all of them at once. Right? It really depends on what we want to analyze. So when you give these inputs, we need to specify them mathematically. And here are the most common inputs we are going to use to represent this physical inputs applied to a system. There are mathematical equivalents here, here. The first one is the impulse function. The impulse function or the Dirac function, it will be represented here as the Dirac delta function. And this represents simply a very uh, large amount of energy provided to a system at a given time and then that energy is removed. It's for example, it, the, the name uh, describes it all. It's an impulse given to the system. And mathematically is going to be represented by the delta function. So the delta function applies a magnitude A when time equals to zero and a magnitude of zero elsewhere for all other times. So we can represent this mathematically by this arrow pointing up. And this arrow here represents that impulse provided to the system at time zero. So here we are talking about a function delta of t, but we could also talk about a function delta of t minus tau, where this tau is a time delay. We know that the system will apply the impulse when whatever is inside here reaches zero. So now we have t minus tau equals to zero. At t equals to tau, this is where the function triggers. 
right? So that adds a time delay to the system and makes the system apply that impulse at t equals to tau. What exactly is this impulse? We could think about it as, for example, a hammer is striking a bell. It's just an impulse given to the hammer and that is removed immediately after. Now, that's some, uh, or we're striking, for example, a hockey puck with the stick. That is also an impulse. It's something that happens in a very, very small amount of time and then is removed. The excitation is removed and then the system goes from there. So that is represented here by this delta function. The second function that will represent very common inputs is the step function, probably a more common one. And the step function can here represent something that is turned on and held on for as time goes to infinity. For example, if I flip a switch in an electrical circuit and I apply a voltage to that circuit, by turning on the switch, I turn on the system and then I let it go to infinity. As time goes to infinity, the excitation continues. Unlike the impulse function, where the excitation is removed immediately after it is applied, in this step function, that excitation continues over time indefinitely. So if you were to plot a function like that, it would be represented by this graph. We have time and the function itself. And at time zero, the function goes to a different value than zero and is held at that value. In this particular case here, that is, this would be the value of A as time goes to infinity. So the step function that is represented by the function u of t is defined as follows. When time is smaller than zero, then the function is zero, nothing happens. And when time is greater than t in this case, then the function goes to a value that we can specify a value of a in this case. What is a exactly? Well, that could be the voltage we are applying to this circuit. So if you turn the cir circuit from a uh, rest and we applied, turn it on to 10 volts, then A would be 10 volts. Uh, in, and then the 10 volts is applied to the circuit. And definitely when you flip a switch at home to turn on a light bulb, we are applying 110 volts to the light bulb and then letting that uh, stay on as time goes to infinity. So A in that case would be 110 volts. If, a, if this step function was there to monitor, for example, let's say a force applied to a mass, if you apply a force to something and we hold that a force constant, then the, the A would be the magnitude of that force, right? So we could also add a time delay to this function. So the function here is being triggered when whatever is inside the bracket, the parent parenthesis here gets to zero. So if you do instead where T in this case is time, t minus tau, then what happens? Then the function will basically go to a when t is greater than tau, right? Because you want t minus tau to be equal to zero. So when t equals to tau, the function triggers. And if you represent it here, the function would just stay to zero up to the point where tau is, is reached and then from there on, it stays constant at the specified value. Notice the difference between the impulse. Once again, the impulse is applied and then removed. The step function remains constant there. Okay. The last signal, the, the third signal is a ramp function. A ramp function is something that increases over time linearly. Here we have defined this function as anything before zero is zero. And when you reach time equals to zero, then the function goes up at a rate that depends on a constant a times t. We could, for example, imagine this as a robot arm that is striking the position of a moving object. The input to that a robot arm is a position, but the position keeps changing over time. So the position goes up, and if it's going up linearly, then uh, in the case, for example, if the object is moving at a constant speed, then A would be the speed, T is time, and the position 
with the multiplication of them, the robot arm now needs to go through certain positions. That is, that, that position is increasing linearly over time because the object is moving at a constant speed. And uh, that becomes now a ramp input. Or for example, if a telescope is tracking a star and the star is moving at a constant speed with respect to the telescope, the telescope needs to adjust its position and its, its desired position is increasing linearly over time. So that would be a ramp input, which is the position of the star moving at a constant speed given to the telescope. In case the position is not, uh, the speed is not constant, so there is an acceleration acting on these objects, then this target position would not go up linearly. It would maybe change and follow a parabolic function. So that would be the third function here, which as you see is simply the integral of the ramp function. Integral of t is t squared over two. And the only difference here is that this function now increases exponentially over time. So here are the definitions of all these three. So impulse, a high pulse apply to a short time. Example, as I said, a hammer is striking a bell. A step is applied at some time and then held constant and the ramp increases linearly over time. So here are some examples. Let's see if this is clear. A constant force applied to a mass, would that be an impulse, a step or a ramp input? A constant force applied to a mass. What do you guys think? Any ideas? A step. It would be yep. a step. Exactly. Very good. It would be a step because it's held at a depth of value as time goes to infinity. A robot tra tracking a target moving at a constant speed. Well, uh, we covered that one already. And that would be the ramp input. Hitting a puck with a hockey stick. I already gave that example as well because the excitation is given and then removed immediately afterwards that it would be an impulse. Impulse. Fluid flow from a pipe when a valve is open. What would that be? Uh, the step function. Would be a step function. Very good step function this would be a step function once the valve is open fluid flows constantly in the at a given rate so that characterizes a ah, step input question so the, the fluid doesn't like go gradually and then if the fluid was going up gradually well it will have of course uh what we call a transient before it reaches a constant flow but it will eventually if it is a constant flow regardless of how we get there, it will be a step. Yeah. If that flow keeps increasing indefinitely over time, then it would be either a ramp or a, a parabolic input. Okay. Any, any other questions here about these signals? No? Okay. Sorry, my iPad is acting a bit here. Just give me one second, I'll fix this. All right, there you go. All right, so that's the first step is to define the inputs we're giving to the system. Now the next step, we're going to see that in the, path, in the next few lectures, is to model the system itself. When you want to model the system, we now need to come up with a set of differential equations that it will describe the behavior of that system. And then you can give these inputs to it and see what happens. The main idea of the model is to simply describe the relation between the input and the output. But these models are never perfect. As I said, we are making some assumptions here. We are assuming that everything is linear, everything is time invariant. So those are approximations of actual models, but they are accurate enough to represent the system properly. So we, ne we need to idealize the models and make some assumptions when we create them. And once everything is put together, now we have a model, 
we have the inputs to that model, we can calculate the outputs, that's where the simulation comes in. We can now give different inputs, change the model a bit, change the model parameters, change the mass, change the coefficient of friction in the model, and see what that happens without even building anything. That's where the simulation plays an important role. And for simulations, we, were, we are going to use MATLAB. Uh, once we have the models, input them in MATLAB, and that's where we'll be able to simulate the system. So as I said, these systems are linear systems and time invariant. So let's first see what a linear system is. So a linear system must uh, uh, must meet two requirements. The first one is that the system must be homogeneous. Just this means, for example, here, if we have a system and we give a input x1, we obtain the output y1. If we now give the system a scaled version of x1, for example, uh, alpha times x1, alpha is a, a constant number. So for example, in the first one, we applied 10 volts and to a system, to a, to a circuit, and we got five amps. Now we're going to give it a scaled version of it. We're going to give, let's say five volts. So alpha would be 0 0.5. What would be the output? Well, if the system is linear, then the output should be the scaled version of the output obtained with the original excitation. If we apply x1, we get y1. If we multiply this x1 by alpha and give that to the system, the output will be the same output times alpha. It will be a scaled version of the previous input. So here is the first case, we get, we apply x1, we got this in the output, y1. If we now apply a scaled version here, alpha x1, then we get alpha y1. Same shape of the output, just a scaled down or up, depending on the value of alpha. So this is the first property that a system must have in order to be linear. The second property is the superposition. This means that if your system is linear and you if apply one input and you apply a separate input and then we apply both inputs together, the output is the sum of any individual inputs given to the system. So here we have x1 given to the system as the input, we obtain y1. If we give x2 to the system, we obtain y2. Question is, what happens if we give x1 plus x2 to the system? Well, if the system is linear, we get y1 plus y2. We get a combination of the individual inputs given to the system. If we add the inputs, we also can add the outputs and we have the, uh, a valid linear system. For example, here, this could be x1, this could be x2. This is the corresponding signal from x1. This is the corresponding signal from x2. If now we apply x1 plus x2, then we should have y1 plus y2, which in this case should be something like that. All right, just adding up these two signals and would be uh, that's would be the signal at the output. Okay, so these two properties are fundamental properties of linear systems. If they are not met, then the system is not uh, is not linear. I'm going to skip this slide here. I'll come back here later. Let's let's just do this example. Are these three systems linear? In this uh, first system here, we have a model that gives the output as a constant times the input. Is this system linear or not? Does this system meet the requirements, the, the properties that we, uh, we, we just discussed? Well, this system is linear it will meet both the requirements. If we can clearly see here that if we give uh, x, uh, we get 
mx in the output. And if you give this x alpha, we get mx alpha. Uh, so this system is just, a, this output is simply a scaled version of the input. If you give this system five votes, for example, we would get uh, 10 votes in the output. And when we give it 10 votes, we would get 20 votes. If you give 30, we'll get 60. Right? So it meets both superposition and is also a homogeneous system. What about the second one? Is the second one linear? Well, clearly this one is not linear because if we give, for example, we see the output of this system is given here is simply the input squared. So if the input of this system is five, let's say, if it was a electrical system, we give an input of five, the output would be 25. If you now give an input of 10, if the system was linear, we should expect to see a factor of five. Now we should be able to see 50. But the system is not linear because it's giving the end output 100. So the first condition that we saw right here is not respected. The system is not linear. It is scaled version. If we scale the input, we are not scaling the output by the same amount. We are actually scaling the output by the square of that value. So in here, if you give x uh, alpha in the input, the output would be x alpha is squared, which is different from x alpha, alpha squared, alpha. Right, so the principle of homogeneity is not respected. What about the last system? Is the last system linear or not? In this last system, the input is x, the output is given by mx plus b. Let's assume, for example, that a m here is a constant, is simply one, and b is also a constant, is two. So y equals to x plus two. Let's give this an input y1 equals to 1. What is the output? y2, uh, uh, sorry, x1 is 1. If x1 is 1, what is the output? It's 3. y1 equals to 3. If you now give this the, uh, a different uh, output, let's say x2 equals to 2, what should we expect to see in the output? Well, if we are scaling the system, you see that the first one was multiplied by a factor of three. So the second one should also be multiplied by a factor of three if it's a linear system. But in fact, we are getting y1 equals to four, not six. So this system is also not linear. If we apply one plus two to the system, which is three, so x3 would be three, y3 is uh, six, uh, five, excuse me, right, which is not necessarily the um, sum of these two guys here. This doesn't add up to seven, as we would think that a linear system would do in case we apply two individual inputs, we look at their outputs, if we add the inputs, we should also be able to add the outputs, but in this case, they don't add up. The system is not linear. Here is one example of this model where the system is not linear. And this could, for example, represent a mass system, a spring system, where the stiffness of that spring is not constant. The spring in this case uh, would be a function, the more you stretch the spring, the stiffer it gets. So the force developed by that spring increases quadratically with the stretch of that spring with the displacement of the spring instead of just doing that uh, um, constant, being constant. It increases the more you stretch that spring. So if you now plot the displacement and the force developed in the spring, you see this parabolic function. And of course, this is not linear. This is exactly the model in the middle here. 
but we could instead using a operating point right in the middle and then assume that around this operating point the system is linear. It would be a fair approximation only around that specific operating point. Okay. Any any questions about the these two properties? No. All right. The other thing uh, I mentioned in the very beginning is that the systems we are using are time invariant. While the the title describes it all, this, the properties of these systems do not change over time which is hardly true in any physical systems. For example, when a plane takes off, it has a certain mass. And when it lands, the mass has decreased because you burned fuel. So the, the model of the system has changed over time. What do we do? Well, we can assume that over a small period of time, the mass is constant. And then you can assume the system to be time invariant within that small window. What does it actually mean mathematically to have a time invariant system? Well, if the characteristics of the system don't change over time, then regardless of when we apply an input to the system, the output should be exactly the same. That's one implication. For example, in the first graph here, if we strike a bell with an impulse at time equals to zero, and you listen to the sound produced by that bell, it would be a curve like that. The sound would slowly decrease and would eventually disappear. If instead of striking the, the, um, the bell at time zero, we do that at time one, what happens? Well, nothing crazy. The only difference is that the, we'll hear the sound one second, at one second, because now the input was delayed by one second, the output is also delayed by one second, but it will follow the exact same shape as the one given at time zero. What happens now if we strike the bell at zero and then at one? So here we see two strikes, at zero and at one. Well, the characteristics of the system don't change over time. So we should see the exact same uh, response is starting at zero and is starting at one. But because this system is linear, it will abide to the principle of superposition, meaning that now when we have two inputs, the output is a linear combination of the two inputs given to the system. So if you now strike the bell at one, zero and at one, then the output should be the linear combination of the two inputs. And you hear the first bang at time equals to zero, then the sound decreases, and then you have the second one, which is simply obtained by adding up the two uh, signals above. Now, why can we add this up? Is it because the system is time invariant? No, it's because the system is linear. The effect of time invariance is observed in the fact that the shape of each individual output does not change. They are exactly the same, despite the fact that the input was applied to the system at different instances in time. So there are two different principles acting here. The superposition allows us to add the effects of two inputs, and the time invariance is telling us that the output of this system is exactly the same, even though they are delayed in time, because the system did not change from uh, between the two strikes. And as I said, this is hardly true in physical systems, but we can assume that for a small window, that is true, and then evaluate the system within that small window. Okay, so this example here where you had a hammer striking a bell, we already gave to the system was a unit step input. Oh, excuse me, it was a, um, was an impulse function, it was an impulse function. So let's go back here to the impulse function and define that a bit more because we needed to, uh, for the next lecture. And this is probably the least intuitive input of them all. So it's good to just reemphasize the concept here. 
the description of the impulse function is to basically give in the system a certain amount of energy in a small amount of time. So here we are going to apply a value of when you have a unit step input. This means that the maximum value of the input is one. And this is going to be applied to the system at a time delta t. And we are going to make this delta t tend to zero. So it's really something that happens in a very, very small amount of time. So we can define the delta function as follows. One over delta t is what we are applying to the system between the time zero and delta t. So of course, if we multiply the magnitude and the time it gives. So if you are applying delta t, sorry, you're applying one over delta t for a period of time delta t, when you multiply them together, this gives one. That's the area in this graph. And that's why we call this a unit step input because the area under the curve is always one. What does that represent physically? Nothing, absolutely nothing. We can't really make any physical sense of it is just the mathematical description of the, is the strikes that we gave to the harmony. Okay. And here is one possible output that it would be obtained by giving that input to the system. If we now delay the input by, by uh, time A, then we would read delta T minus A, because remember that the impulse occurs when whatever is inside that parenthesis becomes zero. So for t minus a to be equal to zero, t needs to be equal to a. So by delaying the input by a, the impulse is only applied at a. And it's now going to be applied when we reach a, but it will be applied for a period of a plus that of delta t such that we maintain the unit area under the curve. What happens to the output? Well, the output will be exactly the same as the previous one, except that it will be shifted from in time by the same amount of a seconds. Okay. For the other input functions, it is the same. They are a lot easier to understand because you can make physical sense of them. This one is a bit abstract. And as we go, we'll see later what exactly we use this for is to induce a certain, certain initial behavior of the system. It will make more sense later, but for now, here is the mathematical foundation for it. It is a bit abstract. I'll give you that, but don't worry about it. We'll make sense of it later when you have models to apply them to. Another thing that we talked about was to make assumptions when modeling something. And these assumptions are required to simplify the system. Here is one example. We have this motorcycle going along this path and we want to determine the speed of the motorcycle when it reaches point B. What kind of assumptions are we, have to, are we going to make here to model this system? Well, there will be a bunch of them. We could, for example, say that the motorcycle and the pilot, they, have, they, they can be represented by a point and this point holds all their mass. So the first example here of a, an assumption we could make is that the mass is concentrated in a point. In a point. And this point represents the entire system. Something else that we can assume here to simplify the system is that mass is constant. Which may not necessarily be true because you are burning fuel and that will affect the entire mass of the system even though that might be um, negligible. What else can we assume? We can assume, for example, that there is no, uh, no um, air resistance. We can also assume that, is, uh, that the wheels are not slipping. There is always traction between the wheels and the ground. What else could we assume here? 
There are many different assumptions, but these assumptions, when you model the system, and most of the time we will have to make them so that we can describe the system with equations. Here is another example. If this skier is jumping on a hill like that, and we want to find uh, how much he travels given the initial speed at point A, what do we need to make or assumptions we have to make? Again, that the skier and the skis can be represented by a point that holds all their masses. There is no air force, drag force in the air. That's another assumption you could make. That at the speed when he leaves or she leaves the slope at point A is in this particular case known to be 40 degrees. What else can we assume? We can assume that the speed at a point A is known and so on. Right, so we have to make these modeling assumptions in two ways. <clears throat> the first one is to simplify the problem itself. And the second one is to make the systems linear time invariant. Most of these two systems would not be, for example, if you consider the drag force in the skier, that would be a quadratic function. So that will not work uh, as a linear system. But if you neglect that, or if you assume a approximate linear model, that might be a good approximation of it. And here, for example, in the uh, motorcycle, we assume the mass to be constant, even though it is not, it might have a negligible effect in the assumptions, in, in the results. Okay, so let's do a few uh, more exercises on, I uh, talked too much as usual, well, let's do a couple exercises here to represent the signals, these input signals better. So here I have all of these you, you will recognize are step functions. U represents the step function, represents that delta. Remember that delta was the ramp function. Uh, excuse me, delta was the impulse function. Here we have six different steps that will be given to a certain system and we want to represent them mathematically. So let's see how we can do them. Let's start with the first one. X1 is equal to the step function minus a step function delayed by a time uh, t minus one. How are we gonna do that? So let me write this expression here. Let's see how many we can do. We have five minutes left. So let me write this one here. So x1 equals to u of t minus u t minus one. How can we represent this function mathematically? So we see two functions here, two step functions. The first one is the step function itself. We know how that one works. If you represent it here, it should be something relatively straightforward, it goes from zero to a value of one, right? This is multiplied by one. And this is a terrible straight line here. Let me try this one more time. It goes to one, and then it stays at one and time goes to infinity. So this would be the function u of t. What is the function u of t minus one? Well, this one triggers when time is greater than zero. Remember that here we have one for time greater than zero and zero elsewhere for time uh, smaller than zero equals or greater to. Now what happens to this one here? This one is t minus one and you want t minus one to be greater than zero, it has to be greater than zero, which means that this is, is uh, met when t is greater than one. And you can see here, for t is smaller than one, you have a negative sign inside the equation. Right, so it would be in this range here, it's zero. And when t exceeds one, then the result here is a positive number and now, we are on the top here, we go to one because one is also being multiplied there. So this function is pretty much 
the same as the other one, except that it will trigger at t equals to one. So it would be a function that it goes like that and it stays at one once time goes to infinity. We are not dealing with individual functions here. Here we're dealing with the u of t minus u of t minus one. So what is the final result? Well, the final result is now the subtraction of these two curves. So you can see that here it's zero minus zero, that's zero. Here it's one minus one, that's zero. So the final result is simply a curve that will make, will disappear after time goes past uh, one. So here the curve simply goes down to zero. And we have the result of that operation there. All right. What does this represent? Well, for example, if we turn on an electrical motor, we apply a voltage to it, we hold that constant for one second and then we turn it off. This can be represented by this function. If you turn on a, a pump for one second and turn it off, that's the same same function. Any questions here? Any questions about this representation? No? Is it, is it because it's clear or is it because you don't know what to ask? No questions? Sure. Next exercises will be a bit more complicated, so. Okay. All right, so let's do the next one. Next one was uh, same now, but it's t plus, it's just one function. And this function we have u of t plus one. So let you think about that, how that would look like. And I'm going to prepare here the board for the next one. So now we have, excuse me, second x2 is u of t plus one. Let me write the uh, definition of the step function here. We want the function to be, in this case, would be one. If this one was multiplied by a constant like say five, would it be simply five when t is greater or equal to zero? And you want this to be zero when t is different than zero. And this was obtained for the function u of t. But now instead of having u of t, we have u of t plus one. So this function will now activate when whatever is inside here, which in this case was t, but now it's t plus one is greater or equal than zero. Meaning that when t, t is greater or equal than negative one, the step function triggers. How does that look like if you plot it? Well, this is negative one. It would reach negative one there and then you stay at the value of one and go to infinity. If this was, let's say, three, then here would have, of course, three. Uh, professor has a question. Um, yeah. So why is in front of one t um, bigger than or equal than zero, or and why t doesn't equal zero in front of zero? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'm having a hard time hearing. Uh, the u of t and then one and then zero. Um, so why specifically t uh, bigger or equals zero and why t doesn't equal zero? Right, so that's the, defi the mathematical definition. Um, so that's constant. It's a constant, yeah. So okay. for this is the standard form, right? So t is inside the function here. So whatever is inside here, we want that to be greater than zero for the function to trigger. And when it's, uh, Sorry, these should have been as less than zero, not different than zero. That wouldn't work. So this is less than zero. Maybe that's where the confusion is going to go. Yeah. Right? And when this is less than zero, 
whatever is inside here, then the function is zero. Now we don't have t, we have t plus one, so the condition is that t is greater than negative one for the function to trigger. Thank you. Okay, yes, that was my mistake. Okay, so that's that for that example. I know we are running out of time, but what I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do one more. Uh, I'm gonna stay until 10, just do a few more. So it's recorded, you can go back to it later, but uh, the lecture is over now. We are uh, running out of time. So feel free to leave. I'm going to continue with one or two more and record them and then post them later. Okay, and I'm gonna do that uh, for most of the lectures. I may go a bit beyond the time if we are recording them so that you have the examples uh, recorded later, right? But uh, the lecture is uh, ended two minutes ago. So feel free to leave if you have other, other class coming up, another class. Okay, but I'm gonna do another one here. Uh, let's do number three. Number three now is uh, x3 is u of negative t plus one. Negative t plus one. Let's see how that one operates. u of negative t plus one. This will help us later when we do convolution integrals. Negative t plus one. Okay, so how how we do deal with this one? Same story again. Whatever. Let me put it here. Uh, call this a. Where a is a, a constant bound. We want the function to trigger when whatever is inside here is greater than zero. So negative t plus one must be greater or equal than zero. Negative t greater than negative one. Multiply everything by negative, negative one is t smaller than, oh, excuse me. Smaller than one. I remember that we multiply the uh, inequality sign by negative one. Yeah, we also have to flip it. So this triggers by when t is smaller than negative than one. So if you have number one over here, the function is now the opposite. It's going to stay zero up to that point. And then when you trigger one, uh, Excuse me, is the opposite. Is the opposite. The function goes to one up to this point. And then when you trigger one, when you pass one, we see that when this t here is greater than one, this will give now a negative value. And then the function goes to zero. There we go. And this magnitude here would be the magnitude of a. Right. So this excuse is, me. Hmm? It wouldn't be like uh, for the it will be a instead of one when it's t is greater or equal to zero. When t is is smaller, let's see. When t is is smaller than one, hmm. you see that uh, this become is always positive. Yes. Right. So we go to a. So the, when this is positive, the function triggers and it goes to a. Okay. All right, so it stays at a up to one, and then see when you pass one, so if you are now here at time equals to two, we have negative two plus one, that's a negative number, and then you fall into this category here, we want the function to go to zero. Yeah, I was talking about the, the system where it's one and zero, so I was, if it starts at a, and then at one it triggers, and then it goes to zero, so, but you wrote one. Right, so this is the original, we can say, this is the original yeah, step that, that, function, right? We could have oh, a here, yeah. 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 I'll just put the unit function there first. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'll do number five, and then uh, I will post the solution to the other two, because we are already 
five minutes late. The next function is a bit more interesting. Let's do x5. It's two exponential of negative t times u of t. So two exponential x5, two exponential of negative t times u of t. So here we have two functions. We have the function u of t, the original one, that it will trigger here when time is zero. And you have the function two exponential of negative t. We can plot this function first, that that function is an exponential function. It decreases exponentially over time and then tends to zero. And when time equals to zero, two exponential, uh, exponential of zero is one, two times one is two. So this will pass by number two there when time equals to zero. What is our step function doing? Well, the step function is zero, the u of t up to zero, and then it goes to one. And it stays at one as time goes to infinity. What are we doing now? We are multiplying this and that, which means that anything before one before zero is zero because you're multiplying the exponential and zero. So anything before that point is zero. And then past this point, now we are multiplying one with the original function and the function remains the same as time, as for time greater than zero. So what is this u of t doing here? It's basically cropping the function and making everything below zero, uh, uh, everything for time less than zero, zero, and then allowing the rest of the function to continue. If this function was delayed by one second, then uh, we would maybe start around here and they have to evaluate this point. So the function would actually step up there and then go to infinity. So this portion here would also be zero and then would have the continuity as time tends to infinity. 